And um, we should be starting. And it's recording. And uh, it's at just a minute before. Uh, and so I'm going to type into the chat room. Those of you viewing us on YouTube, please let us know if you can see slash hear us. There you go. Okay. So, uh, good evening and welcome to the beautiful, historical, and uh, somewhat dangerous uh, aspect of the Marionette Theater here. If you're tuning into us on YouTube, you'll see me in the thrux of um, mayhem and switches and buttons. <laughs> DJ, throw the left switch! The red button! Hit the red ah, button! Ah! Not that Hit button! Ah! Where is the con where is the operations manual when you need it? Dump the steam. Uh, <laughs> fill the, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the instructions are in Swedish. I hate this kit furniture. Instructions are in Swedish. Oh, moon, moon, work, work, work. Kling and hing and thing perkin. <laughs> so until we get somebody to confirm that they can hear us, uh, we'll just carry on for another moment or two. So I'm going to type that into the chat room. We are going to carry on until we get confirmation. Woo! And, uh, you know, this is where Hubby shows up late and says, uh, I hear you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we're doing something new, folks. Um, we've ditched a thing and we're doing another thing. And now uh, you can see us on YouTube and you can use the chat room in Nivea, uh Discord. Oh, Tommy Hashbrand says, can hear yous. Yes. Yay. Well, I suggest that we just go about and start. All righty, dighty, and uh, those of you who are uh, late to join the party, you're just gonna miss out on uh, the banana splits that uh, Gertie is serving up there. <laughs> oh. oh yeah, it's radioactive. Never mind. Oh well, that's how they get nice and cooked all the way through. I love those mashed bananas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Good evening and welcome to the beautiful, historical Marionette Theater. Tonight, we're going to be going on a uh, excursion. We're visiting a nuclear power plant. Yeah, the dangerous uh, place. DJ's in control, folks. Woo! So yeah, put on your hard hat. And be sure to grab your seats, because the show is about to begin. Oh, good evening. Hey there, Toppy. How are you Hi, this DJ. fine night? Well, I'm fine. I mean, honestly, you know, global warming. I mean, today was like 85,000 degrees. And I don't know, two days ago it was in the 30s. So what do I know? Anyways, now fine. Everything's perfectly normal. <laughs> I, You know, when it became spring, I was so happy that I was going to be able to start taking my morning walks again. And I mm -hmm. think I got to do that for all of one week. Granted, I was working from home that week, but I wanted yeah. to still come home from work and do my sunset walk. Uh, no, uh. it wasn't happening because it was too damn cold. <laughs> well, um, I just want everyone to know who's listening that outside of my uh, studio... I'm podcasting with windows open mm. and in the distance, I hear thunder, which also sounds a lot like a nuclear accident. <laughs> uh, and so I'm already on edge. 
Well, uh, I, uh, I too am podcasting with Windows open. And if you happen to hear the Bumpus's dogs, it's actually the security guards' dogs at the power plant. <laughs> oh, fine. That makes sense. Uh, DJ, quick, mm-hmm. flip the red switch. Woo, okay. woo, yeah. woo. Hey, no, oh, that's no. the wrong one. That's the submarine <laughs> sound effect. Oh, good, yeah. <laughs> Nuclear. All clear. Uh, let's, get Gertie. let's get Gertie in here. Yes. Gertie, uh, please to join us. Yeah. Hi. Ooh. Hi. Hi. I should have been Jane Fonda in this movie. That's what I should have been cast. I I did try out for the role, and they rejected me. Anyways, it's fine. I've survived, and uh, yeah. Well, I'm glad to see that you uh, watched the movie because she's right in style tonight. Gertie, like Jane Fonda, is a redhead tonight. Wow. <laughs> I am. I, you know, DJ, that's sweet of you to notice, really. <laughs> You know, I kind I kind of love you. Oh, there, there's still a restraining order, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> well, could you get your cute little tootsies down there and let the folks know what we're watching tonight? Okay. Yeah, by the way, it's real serious tonight. Okay, I'm going down. Okay, here I go. Bye. Bye. Oh, don't trip. There she goes. Okay, here we go. Kimberly is a beautiful, aspiring TV reporter who has long been relegated to doing light comic relief, feel-good news bites for her... What do you get when you take a dash to the silver screen? A pinch of golden oldies and a smidgen of screaming. It's time for Matinee Minutia with your host, DJ and Toppy. What? Good God. What is that? Eyewitness News. (laughs) If you're tuning into us here on YouTube tonight, you'll be... Seeing me in the control room of the power plant. Now, that's scary if you ask me. Uh, Okay, Jack. I'm also on location with my camera. (laughs) How about them apples? Yeah, don't don't film anything you're not supposed to. (laughs) That's what they say uh, at the casino, you know. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, uh, DJ uh, Tommy Hashbrows, our good friend, who joins us live here uh, because he's just such a pal. Every week. And he says, uh, as far as all of this, you know, uh, clandestine government stuff, he says, try living right next to Fort Drum. Mm. There you go. I don't know. Be, you know. Be, well, you know what they say. Be all you can be. 
Uh. <laughs> so, Toppy, uh, you know, this film came out in 1979. Uh, yeah. And that was a did. while ago. But um, we have a clip here. It's the trailer. This is what yeah. people would have seen uh -huh. if they were the movie going sort back then. Okay. Here we go. Folks, this is, this is a great trailer. Watch, uh, listen, listen to this. It's all about that good speaking voice. Oh. The China Syndrome. It's about people. People who lie. And people faced with the agony of telling the truth. Right. Okay. People like Kimberly Wells, a television reporter paid to smile, not to think. A few words about a veterinarian who makes house calls on sick fish. Or is it aquarium calls? Richard Adams, a cameraman who never learned how to play by the rules. Wait till you get that other room, get that radiation all over that cute little body. Jack Goodell, an engineer who knows too much to tell the truth. In anything that man ever does, there's some element of risk, right? Well, that's why we have what we call defense in depth. And cares too much to lie. No accident. It will start with a tremor in a nuclear power plant. Where it will end will depend on three people. I would say you're probably lucky to be alive. Same for the rest of Southern California. Jane Fonda. Let's face it, you didn't get this job because of your investigative abilities. Kimberly, don't fight it. Jack Lemmon. There was a vibration. Michael Douglas. I don't know that accident is the right word. Accident is the right word. The China Syndrome. The harder they try, the more resistance they meet. They've got their own security men. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you want me to make it any clearer? The closer they get. No. The more threatening it becomes. No. The China Syndrome. No. Today, only a handful of people know what it really means. And they're scared. Everybody keep your strength! Everybody keep your strength! Soon, you will know. The China Syndrome. Oh, and you thought the store running out of milk was scary seriously all right normally at this time we might uh we might ask dj to like tell us what was going on in the world in 1979 but tonight i want to tell you a personal little story about what uh i w was going on with me in 1979 when this movie came out and a few scant days later when a real life nuclear power accident occurred at a Three Mile Island nuclear plant in Pennsylvania, which isn't all that really far away from Pickle Hollow. And it really disturbed me. I was minding my own, trying to finish high school. And he uh, woke up and on the news, on the radio, oh, this is a, oh, an accident. Ooh, we don't know what's happened, uh, but there's a lot. Well, partial meltdown. Yes, a partial meltdown of the core at Three Mile Island nuclear plant in Pennsylvania. Well, if that didn't grab my gonads at the time, listen. For a couple of days, none of us knew what was going to happen. It could have been really, really bad, or we just didn't know. All we did was hang out and listen to our radio. It was horrible. But in one of the oddest co-minglings of real life and cinema, this accident occurred just days after the release of the movie we're talking about tonight, The China Syndrome. Mm. So how bizarre was that? Well, listen, uh, I can't remember if I went to see this movie before or after the Three Mile Island power plant. I think it was after. And it was so on the mind of me and all of us and everybody that I think it compelled us to go see this movie, which was about, coincidentally, 
<laughs> uh, the failure at a nuclear power plant. And you know what was the oddest coincidence? The oddest coincidence was that the real life mess up in Pennsylvania happened because of a faulty gauge. A dial was just plain stuck and wasn't moving where it was supposed to. In the mo <laughs> in the movie, Jack Lemon glances at a dial and just sort of goes, hmm. And ticks it with his finger. <laughs> Suddenly, the dial plunges. And that's when he goes, oh, God. <laughs> so how coincidental is that? The movie depicted a stuck dial and the real life incident concerned a stuck what the hell was going anyways conspiracy theories all over the fucking place anyways well uh in a matter of days uh we all knew that the, there was a well there was a partial meltdown at three mile island but uh containment actions uh worked uh, there was a release of a lot of radioactive material into the atmosphere, and everybody thought they were going to die. <laughs> but anyways, uh, talk about a real-life incident that would go on to spur ticket sales for a movie. Mm -hmm. Because the China Syndrome, well, I was doing okay before Three Mile Island, but once Three Mile Island hit... Oh, my God. People went to see the China Syndrome in droves. It was a weird, just the weirdest conflagrance of real life and media that I ever remember. So, that's my own personal remembrance it was a bit traumatizing, mm. and it took a few days for the real-life um, tragedy to work itself out. And then there was just this weird movie in the wake that I went to see like three or four more times mm -hmm. because it was just so freaking weird. Mm. Um, so that's my personal experience with the movie The China Syndrome. And the real life incident that occurred just a matter of days after the movie's release. So, DJ, mm -hmm. on back to 79. Tell us uh, some celebrity voice. All righty. So, back there in 79. Uh, I actually was uh, probably uh, causing trouble under the table and, you know, pulling things down. Uh, <laughs> Jennifer Love Hewitt came into this world in that time. She's an independent rock musician. She's also the uh, wife or the, um, the widow of the late Kurt Cobain, you know, the one from, um, oh, uh, I I'm forgetting the name of the band, sorry. And then also that year was Adam Levine, yeah. the uh, yeah. musician of from Maroon 5. You were going to say, Toppy? Or? No, I, was, oh. I can't help you with the name of that band. I can't <laughs> Nir remember. Nirvana, that's it. Okay. Nirvana! Yes. Uh, so Adam Levine was also born in 79. He's the lead singer from the band Maroon 5 and also an actor. And uh, in that year also came to a singer and jazz musician, Nora Jones, and uh, from The Cosby Show. Uh, of course, she's done other things as well, but most known for the character of Rudy Child actress, Keisha Knight Pulliam. We also have uh, actress from uh, ABC's My So-Called Life, which, of course, brought to us the uh, the fabulous Mr. Wilson Cruz, who is the uh, very attractive doctor on Star Trek Discovery. There's your Star Trek. Uh, Claire Danes was born in 79. Oh, dear. Uh, also, Kate Hudson. Now, you probably may not know it because of her name, but she's actually the daughter of Goldie Hawn, was born in 79. I always forget that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Rosario Dawson, who was in Rent, speaking of Wilson Cruz, along with uh, him, 
Is she was also in Josie, the movie the Josie and the Pussycats, Rosario Dawson. Also, not a favorite, but notable uh, star of the Marvel Universe, Chris Pratt in Guardians okay. of the Galaxy. And then lastly, but certainly not least, the s- pop singer and musician Pink. Uh-huh. So, this was... Uh, You know what, Mm -hmm. DJ, what would have happened if Josie and the Pussycats toured the Three Mile Island nuclear plant at the time (laughs) time of the... Anyways, I don't know. Uh, I think that Laverne and Shirley showed up. (laughs) Shlamazel. Shlamazel. (laughs) Hop and stop and nuclear power. Uh, Anyway. Oh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that my generation had their own version of Three Mile Island, although it was overseas, it was the Chernobyl. Oh, Oh, for God's sake, DJ, that was even worse. Yes, it was. And, uh, of course, we still talk about it to this day. Yeah, Uh, that was, uh, like, truly, that was the world's worst nuclear accident. Far uh, out-damaging anything that happened at Three Mile Island, Mm -hmm. right? Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, the mutant creatures that (laughs) slither around Chernobyl right now, we'll never know, right? (laughs) Well, until they run for public office anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. All right. Oh, I mean, Jane Fonda is in this film, and she is well known to be an activist, so I just had to. (laughs) <laughs> okay. All right. So let's uh, cut straight on on the movie coming out and how how did China Syndrome fare in the box office? Well, you know, it was probably pretty uh, popular around the time that you were saying that Three Mile Island happened because it, yeah. it was very topical. But overall, for the the mark for the year, it falls somewhere in our sweet spot of we gotta love it. <laughs> Because it was one of the hits that fell from the box office. No, <laughs> China Syndrome came out in March of 79. So it was sort of a an early spring release, if you will. But the yeah. top performing films that year included uh, Mr. Hubba Hubba and Tights, Christopher Reeves. Number one was well, Superman. Well, how do you compete with that, DJ? Come on. I mean, he could curl some hair. Um, (laughs) Number two in the box office that year was um, Babs's future husband, Mr. James Brolin, and Margot Kidder in Amityville Horror. That brought in $86.4 million. Now, Superman brought in $134 million. Also, I just want to say, I don't think I realized until just now that Margot Kidder was in Superman and the Amityville Horror in the same year. I don't think mm-hmm. I knew that. Mm-hmm. And uh, rounding out the top of the box office, it was a sequel. Made $85 million, Sylvester Stallone in Rocky II. Ah, uh, whatever. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd rather see James Brolin shirtless. Actually, but... you know what? Uh, Rocky II was... Just as good as the first Rocky, in my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. So if we were to put the China Syndrome at the middle of the box office for that year, eh, to give you an idea of the the ballpark, the movie that was one better than the middle of the box office was a film with John Belushi and Karen Allen. National Lampoon's Animal House brought in $21.5 million. And just the rung below huh. that was a horror film. It was uh, the 79 version of Dracula with Frank Langella, Lawrence Olivier, of all people, and uh, a topic of a past episode here on Met Name Minutia, Kate Nelligan in Dracula in 79. Yeah. Langella. Frank Langella. Langella. I went to a drive-in all by my lonesome because... I was just kind of the weird kid that would go to drive-ins on his own. Okay? Don't ask me to explain further. I just did. Did you drive the family station wagon? (laughs) I may as well have because they would always say, do you have anybody in the trunk of your car? No. Do you? And I'd say, 
No. Anyway, uh, yeah, I went to see Dracula with Frank Langella in the drive. Now, anyway, you know what? What kind of a year in cinema has Superman, the China Syndrome, National Lampoon's Animal House, and Dracula coming out the same year? <laughs> but we're never going to see a year like that again. It mm. just doesn't happen. No, that was leading into a really big year, and 80 was even bigger than 79, but it had... You know, quite the the uh, diverse lineup of films like 79 did. Yeah. Oh, Tommy Hashbrun's in the chat room. Oh, I forgot all about this. The Fukushima disaster in 2011. Oh, fuck me. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Focus All, uh, it <laughs> suffered a meltdown and a release of radioactive material after a soon. Oh, my God. That was after the tsunami barreled into it. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Oh, well, no wonder. And, and we, oh. I hear that just like Chernobyl, the area around that particular reactor, because we all take it for granted and assume that just because these disasters happen, the whole plant gets shut down. No, no, no. There are sections and buildings to these things. There are a sprawling complex. So they just shut down part of it because that's where the problem was. True. Uh, uh, a, 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 a nuclear power plant is a vast arena of all kinds of things. By the way, the big things you see sticking out of the ground are cooling towers. Uh, that's what those are. They look very ominous, especially on the horizon of any place, any place you see them. Uh, but they're, they're just cooling towers. That's all they do. They cool the water. Anyways, let's talk about the director. Well, it's Jane Bridges. Well, we just visited James Bridges when we did the paper chase a few episodes ago. Well, if you remember, he did uh, a, a lot of television in his early years, and then he transitioned to motion pictures with his directorial debut, The Baby Maker, starring Barbara Hershey. Uh, by the way, uh, James Bridges' life partner, uh, he was a gay man and lived a, a long, long, long time with his life partner, Jack Larson. And uh, Jack Larson produced a lot of the movies that James Bridges either wrote or directed. Uh, his movie, Before China Syndrome, was September 30, 1955, with Richard Thomas, who was John Boy in the Waltons. An obscure, strange little movie that uh, never went nowhere. But by God, if you can see it, I recommend it. Anyways, after the China Syndrome... Bridges directed Urban Cowboy, a certifiable giant mega hit with John Travolta and Deborah Winger. Hmm. So that's the director, and we got quite a cast here, DJ. We sure do. Now, we don't often uh, chance upon this opportunity. We are just before the halfway mark in the show. So we're going to step on over here to our snack bar, where oh. um, in light of our disaster film, Gertie's serving up some Boilermakers. <laughs> You're funny, DJ. I like that. Yes, I am. Oh, I'll have they're, a... They're radioactive, too, boy, I uh, bet you. They're green, just like my drink. Check it out ah. on YouTube. Uh, all righty so for your listening enjoyment uh we're going to be listening to a snippet from an interview with our favorite dallas uh broadcaster bobby wyant who i'm thinking oh. of calling texas tammy oh um, texas T bobby we love you so much <laughs> take it away all right here we go Jane, there's another uh, facet to the picture, the China Syndrome, and that is you are a woman broadcast journalist. Okay. How now, do you do? <laughs> <laughs> yes, how do you do? What did you think of that part of All it? All right, Jane, I was very proud of um, certain things that you, that I felt were really Jane Fonda getting into the role of a woman broadcast journalist. 
did you do some homework? Did you get around with some women and talk with them and maybe, you know, go out with them? Sure. Now? Heidi Schulman, Robin Grove, Christine Lund, Kelly Lang, Jackie Kin, King, a lot of the women in the L.A. Uh, market that I knew or had the privilege of coming to know during the course of my research showed me how you do a shot from a live minicam, how the whole minicam technology works, how do you put a story together on your feet. I went out with uh, with Robin Groth to uh, to cover Betty Ford at some event in Los Angeles. Betty Ford never showed up, so she had to go and invent a story and watched how all of that gets done. And my respect for your work and for what you have to do and, and how hard it is grew tremendously. Uh, it also helped me to be on the other end of the microphone because I, you know, I, I, uh, I can sympathize with where you're coming from more. Jane, do you think that the kind of person that you are, and especially because you do have opinions on things, do you think that you could be a successful broadcast journalist? And I mean not doing very special things as a personality in journalism, but just doing the workaday type things. Uh, I would find it very hard. To I be objective. Yeah, I would find it very hard. I mean, just for example, right? When Betty Ford was coming to Los Angeles, it was uh, shortly after she had been in Iran spending New Year's with the Shah of Iran, the former Shah of Iran. And um, the woman who was going to interview her was going over the questions that she wanted to ask her about um, uh, why, for example, Betty Ford had, not Betty, uh, 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 Roz Carter, I'm sorry, Roz Carter had, uh, said something about the fact that women were not allowed to be present during a business meeting. And I said to the reporter, I think you should ask, what the hell were you doing there in the first place? Why should the President of the United States and his wife be spending any time at all with someone like the Shah of Iran? Well, you can say I would have been fired immediately. Oh. <laughs> but, you know, I would have had a hard time pretending like it's all right for anyone that represents our country to be with a man like the Shah of Iran. That's why I don't, I'm not a journalist, but I like it. I enjoyed it. I, I think that it's, it's interesting work. It, uh, it's stimulating. It requires a lot of intelligence that you're not always allowed to show, but that you have to have to be good at it. Okay. So that was just a snippet from the interview. And apparently not long before, Jane Fonda had also done an interview with Barbara Walters, and uh, due to the subject matter of this film featuring a nuclear power plant, there were some protests, including the possibility that GE may have withdrawn their sponsorship of Barbara Walters' program. Oh, wow. I don't remember that, but I totally believe it. So Jane Fonda played Kimberly Wells in The China Syndrome. It was her 20th film. But, DJ, we discussed Jane Fonda way back in our premiere episode. We sh- Barbarella. We sure did. But just remind us about what Jane Fonda was doing. Okay. So, Jane was the daughter of legendary Hollywood... Hollywood... Yeah, I'll, I'll get my teeth in. Hollywood actor Henry Fonda and brother of actor Peter famous for independent film breakthrough of Easy Rider in 69. Before the China Syndrome, Jane Fonda was in a film called California Sweet, which was by Neil Simon. And after China Syndrome, Fonda starred in The Electric Horseman, the long-awaited reunion of Fonda and Robert Redford, who were so memorable together in Barefoot in the Park way back in 67. Slight side note, Toppy, I once saw Richard Thomas in a play version of Barefoot in the Park. It was the, no kidding. the first time I ever saw it, and come to find out, it was an HBO exclusive, so huh. it's hard to find. Anyways, uh, what made Fonda's participation in China Syndrome notable were the many real-life political and environmental concerns Fonda was famous for, including the Vietnam War, race relations, feminism, rape, LGBT concerns, Native American issues, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, as you just heard her speak about, marriage and divorce issues, and 
health concerns like bulimia, breast cancer, and osteoporosis, all of which were causes she petitioned, advocated for, and supported long before other celebrities came to the fold. And let us not forget how many leg warmers she sold during her days as an early creator of VHS exercising industry. Ah! Oh boy, yes, that's for sure. No, you know, Toppy, before I was old enough to pay attention to uh, famous people in the movies, um, yeah. my first exposures, honk, to uh, movies was watching them on the home box office those winters mm. when dad would get mom's okay because he couldn't be out in the yard. And uh, mm -hmm. I remember watching uh, the uh, film on Golden Pond. Oh. And I just, in hindsight, think of that as such a wonderful way of portraying aging and a adult child's concern for their elder parents. It was beautiful, TJ. Just a beautiful movie. Uh, and she got to be in it yeah. with her father. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the most amazing thing. So, Toppy, uh, another member yeah. of the cast who was the plant manager is someone that we've talked about before. In fact, uh, the other year we watched a film during the election season. It was My Fellow Americans. Who was in that? <laughs> None other than our favorite Jack Lemon. He played Jack Goodell, uh, the plant supervisor. He was born in Massachusetts. He made... Uh, his beginning on TV in the early 50s. His first leading roles were in Three for the Road with Betty Grable. And most notably, Mr. Roberts with Henry Fonda and James Cagney in 1955. And then no one would ever forget the pairing of Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon in The Odd Couple in 1968. Moving right up to the China Syndrome, that was his 36th movie. Whoa. The film he did prior was Airport 77. And by God, folks, I just want to tell you, as far as the airport franch franchise goes, I will watch Airport 77 over and over again, above and beyond any other airport movie. I just want to tell you. <laughs> Um, so, Airport 77. Oh, Olivia de Havilland was in that, but mostly it was Brenda Vaccaro and Darren McGavin. Did she get to say, please fasten your seatbelts? <laughs> this is Brenda Vaccaro. And, and put, a, put, on, uh, put in your, I don't <laughs> your know. Your Kotex? Okay. <laughs> got it before me. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. This flight is brought to you by, um, you know, women's sanitary napkins and um, uh, good hygiene. Yeah. Hello, I'm Brenda McConnell. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, good boy. Uh, after. Um, wait a minute. Was it after? Anyways. Uh, <laughs> Jack Lemmon did a movie called Tribute, and uh, and that was just after uh, China Syndrome. He did a million movies, folks. And before his passing in 2001, at the age of 76, he had 100 acting credits. In the more recent years, the last decade of his life included movies you probably remember, like in 12 movies. He was a busy man. Uh, the Grumpy films, Grumpy Old Men and Grumpy Old Men, My Fellow Americans, we did that right here on the mm, show. Sure did. And uh, uh, he, in 98, he returned to the role of Felix Unger in the sequel to the 68 film, The Odd Couple. And by that time, Lemon had teamed up with Walter Matthau, who, in real life, they were very, very good friends, beloved friends. And Lemon teamed up with Matthau previously in the aforementioned Gum films, films, as well as Out to Sea in 97. I think that's the last thing they did with Diane Cannon, Elaine Stritch, and Brent Spiner. Lemon was a consummate actor. He was capable of doing everything 
from comedy to drama. And I think somehow in the China Syndrome, he lent a believability factor to this guy that was so worried about what he thought was happening versus what his bosses told him had happened and his eventual belief that there was a terrible cover-up and that led him into a spiral where he eventually took arms and infiltrated his own power plant to take control because he believed that the power plant was an imminent danger of destruction. Hmm. Michael Douglas, DJ. Okay. Uh, well, this is really interesting because <clears throat> Michael Douglas was the son of famed American actor Kirk Douglas. His big thing was TV. He got into a TV show. And the biggest thing that happened to him after that is that his daddy gave him a film project. So, DJ, take it away from there. All righty. So, Mr. Mike Douglas was born in 44, you know, just when the war was getting over. He was an American actor and film producer. He re has received many numerous accolades, including two Academy Awards, five Golden Globes, Primetime Emmy Award, and the Cecil B. DeMille Award, and the AFI Life Achievement Award. As we are saying, he is the elder son of the famous legendary American actor and producer Kirk Douglas. Douglas received his Bachelor of Arts, so, uh, you know, he, uh, he got his sheepskin in drama from the University of California at Santa Barbara. His early acting roles included film, stage, and television productions. Douglas first achieved prominence for his performance in the ABC police procedural TV series, The Streets of San Francisco, for which he received three consecutive Emmy Award nominations. A Gwen Martin production! Yeah, with Carl Malden! And uh, <laughs> Douglas's first big cinematic score was in 75, where he produced One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, of course, with Jack Nicholson. And, um... What's her name behind me? Louise Fletcher. Yes. Oh, Louise, do not let her into the power plant. <laughs> oh, we would like to see Play. that. I think that was a Natalie Wood movie. Oh, <laughs> uh, so um, having acquired the rights to the Ken Kesey novel from his father, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is what we're talking about. It was a very substantial gift to him. The film received critical and popular acclaim and won the Academy Award for Best Picture, earning Douglas his first Oscar as one of the film's producers. Now, Douglas went on to produce films including The China Syndrome and uh, Romancing the Stone in 84, for which he received the Golden Globe Award for Best Motion Picture, Musical or Comedy, and, of course, in 85, is in The Jewel of the Nile. And in these movies, he also acted, bringing him ever more clout as a bona fide movie star. Douglas later received critical acclaim for his part in movies like Wall Street in 87. I think Martin Sheen might have been in that one. Uh, for, or Charlie, maybe. For which he won the Academy Award for Best Actor. Other notable roles include A Chorus Line in 85, in 87, Fatal Attraction, War of the Roses in 89, and Basic Instinct in 92, Falling Down in 93, The American President in 95, The Game in 97, and in 2000, Traffic. More recently, Wonder Boys in 2000, and Solitary Man in 09. Now in 2013... He, uh, for his portrayal of Liberace in the HBO film Behind the Candelabra, uh, Mike Douglas won the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Miniseries or Movie. And in 2018, Douglas starred as an aging acting coach in the Netflix comedy series The Kuminsky Method, for which he won a Golden Globe Award for Best Actor. Most recently, you would have seen Douglas in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, appearing in the films Ant-Man in 2015, 
Ant-Man and the Wasp in 2018 at Avengers Endgame in 2019. And then most recently, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania in 2023. All right. Well, this is a freaking solid cast. And the movie is very serious with everything it does. And it uh, portrays the whole incident from beginning to end. And really, DJ, was this the first time you saw it? It was. Um... I want to. I want to ask you this straight out. Mm-hmm. Did this seem preposterous to you, or, yeah. or what? No, um, you know, I, I, I got the feeling that there was something building up because of this is a story about an aspiring reporter. You know, she's got the gig at the local station, but of course they've just got her there as the pretty face and she'd like to do more. So you, you get the feeling that there's going to be an opportunity for her to get noticed and recognized, but you don't get quite what that's going to be until they take the drive and they're at the power plane. So you think to yourself, oh, well, this is just going to be a routine visit. When, of course, what could happen? But, you know, the the, the worst thing that you could imagine, the, the place begins to shake. And then they say, oh, no, everything's fine. And by the way, you shouldn't be recording in here. <laughs> ah. Um. It has an ending that is very violent and, uh, spoiler alert, for heaven's sakes, Mm -hmm. it's an old movie, folks. (laughs) Jack Lemmon gets gunned down. Did that seem preposterous to you? Oh, my. Well, um, I I think that uh, that was a turning point for a couple of the characters. You know, um, one of the characters that we didn't have time to discuss was played by Mr. Wilford Brimley, who, um, you know, for me growing up, he was the uh, <laughs> the kindly grandfather, head of household, and um, his child co-star was none other than Shannon Doherty, who would later go on to 90210. Oh, that. Wait, what was he in? It was a show called Our House, and he Mm. was the grandfather of the series. I don't think it probably got more than two seasons, but Tommy will probably let me know if I'm wrong. But Wilford Brimley was um, the the guy. He he was he was uh, the plant manager's uh, employee. You know, he 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 made no bones about it that he was not. An educated man. He did not have a degree. He was not the company employee. He was the flunky who was there to push the buttons when he was asked to. And he he was convinced that if anyone was going to be the fall guy, it was going to be him. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, while we're talking about spoilers, there's that uncomfortable exchange the day after the company has their little reviews with the employees and come to find out he was under the hot lights for three hours. Yeah. Uh, Wilford Brimley folks, you know, this guy because he's been a character actor in a million movies. Uh, I remember, I remember him finally from the Waltons, the first season where he played a reoccurring character who would always show up. On Ike's store uh, front, <laughs> whittling wood Ooh. and uh, saying, well, uh, oh, the Waltonkins are coming up to the store with no shoes. Anyways, <laughs> no. And then later, you all know him because he was the spokesman for the Diabetes yes. Association. And he had the Beatty's feet. I got the Beatty's feet. And I mean, <laughs> anyway, I think no. I think for a while he was also the spokesperson for Quaker Oatmeal too. Oh my God, was he? Well, I wouldn't put it that way. <laughs> but uh, mostly, I think his true prominence was in the uh, 
the movie with the aliens and the cocoons. Oh, yeah. And the thingies with the thingy and they lived forever or whatever. Uh, yeah, you know, that was another of those films that I caught there on the HBOs. But, you know, kind of doing the reverse of what we normally do in Star Trek. Wilford Brimley was also in that movie, My Fellow Americans, with Jack Lemmon. So they must be oh. following each other or they must have been following each other around the craft services <laughs> yeah he played a great villain against uh oh in a in a one of those uh lawyer movies uh, can't think of it anyways he was a great villain mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, anyways anyways he got the beady feet you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Well, so, Toppy, you were saying about, um, you know, impressions of having seen this the first time. I was actually really pleased with Wilford Brimley's character because uh, Jane Fonda's character gets her shining moment. She has the opportunity to become the reporter that she wants to be. And it's in that moment after Jack has been shot and she comes up to... Wilford Brimley's character, who, unbeknownst to her, declares himself as the guy's best friend. So now he's in a position where he can either accept the company's excuse that he was off his rocker and drunk and under the influence, or he could speak the truth. DJ, that's a beautiful moment in the movie. It's the climax. It's so powerful because from the beginning, everyone was reluctant to give Kimberly this opportunity because she did the the light news and she fought for the story and she uh, happened to be there. Not happened. She made herself be there because she was involved with the Jack Lemmon character. And Jack Lemmon demanded that Kimberly be there uh, to, to so that he could give a message to the, to America about the fact that this power plant was in grave danger of having an accident. So uh, at the very end, she's overwhelmed. She's tearing up. Jack's been shot. She approaches Wilfred Brimley's character. She can barely do it. She, she's barely holding on. But at the last minute, she gets herself together and she gets the story from Wilfred Brimley. And she concludes the broadcast. And, and what a moment. What a moment. This is amazing filmmaking. It certainly is, and I think one of the most possibly, I don't want to say overlooked, but one of the most trivial moments in the film that, you know, they they could have not included it, but is so important, is when she just so happens to run into Jack Lemmon's character at the bar when she's looking for her cameraman friend who has the footage. So that presents an opportunity and she gets to meet him outside of his familiar space as an everyday person. And that helped her later on, as you were just saying, to relate to him outside of being the plant manager, but actually of being a human being and a person that is now missed. Yeah. This film works on so many levels. It's a conspiracy. It feels so real. Uh, Nuclear power plants at this time were controversial. There were issues even before Nine Mile Island. uh, People worried about, well, what do you do with this nuclear waste? Mm -hmm. Well, it's still an issue today, folks. (laughs) Well, do you know, Toppy, out here in the not-quite-apple country, there is a power plant close enough that some of the pharmacies and grocery stores keep those pills that people are supposed to have that are exposed. Well, there you go, folks. <clears throat> the closest I lived to one was when I was in Rochester, and somewhere near Rochester is a nuclear power plant. Uh, I looked up something. Uh, I want to say this is just rough, folks, and I'm forgetting a few things, but basically there are about, in the United States, 
only. There's about 50 operating power plants that are operating on some level. And whether that's full percent or partial or whatever, um, uh, there are two power plants that are actually in production right now. It's pretty rare because people don't still don't trust this technology, even though it's as clean as a whistle. Well, except for the waste. <laughs> uh, anyway, we don't want to think about that. Uh, by the way, the the stupid thing about nuclear power plants is it's as simple as this. Rather than use fossil fuels or coal to burn water, to make it steam, to turn the turbines, to make electricity, they use heat from nuclear power rods that create fission that creates energy that heats the water that makes the steam to turn the turbines it's just turning the turbines Mm. that makes electricity that's all it is that's nuclear power plants except they're not using coal or fossil fuels or whatever and to this day you know there's talk about well okay let's just shut down every single damn power plant in the united states and that would leave us with 20 percent less power than we have now and how do we make up for that well there's no other way you're going to burn fossil you're going to burn coal you're going to do something like that and uh, the loss of lives to pollution is somewhat significant, although no one ever thinks about that. So the debate continues. Mm-hmm. Is this a wise thing? Is it not? We'll never know. Power plants are operating to this day. Uh Chernobyl is the worst example of something that happened. And there's mutant Jack Lemons running around. And no, I don't know. And anyway, <laughs> no, anyways, it's fine. Anyways, uh, what a, this was a great movie. And mm-hmm. for me to experience it when this real life nuclear uh, uh, accident happened. It was just the weirdest, most fakakta, weirdo thing ever. And I seriously remember for more than a few days just wondering if I was going to be alive the next day. Hmm. So there you go, folks. Uh, This is a great uh, conspiracy movie. It's a great thriller beyond and above anything else it's a great thriller that you're going to be entertained by all righty so we've reached the uh later part of our program that we call our snack tray and that's because this is uh what's left over and uh you know we would like to tell you about other programs that you might enjoy if you liked um the China Syndrome. Now, yeah, it, and I saw what you picked, DJ. I think mm-hmm. this is a great selection. Yeah. Now, also, I just wanted to note because we don't always tell folks if you are interested in seeing the China Syndrome, um, it is not included in any of the streaming services that you're already subscribed to, but you can rent it in places probably like Apple TV. I saw it on Prime Video, so. Um, yeah, I uh, I rented it on YouTube mm-hmm. for three bucks or whatever. Yeah, it's worth it. I mean, you would pay more for that if we still had Blockbuster these days, you know? So, uh, uh, a film that I'm going to recommend, and I'm actually going to make an honorable mention outside of this one. Uh, I'm going to recommend a film from 83 with up-and-coming Meryl Streep and uh, Goldie Hawn's future hubby, Mr. Kurt Russell, and, of course, the uh, the everlasting and ever-living and never-aging Cher. Um, from- a Cher on a central, significant role. Mm-hmm. She's a lesbian who just happens to be a character in the movie who's a lesbian. It was a breakthrough for everyone in uh, gay culture where she wasn't there because she was going to die of AIDS or anything. 
She just happened to be gay and in this story. Yeah, so I'm referring to Silkwood. And this is the story of Karen Silkwood, who's a metallurgy worker at a plutonium processing plant who was purposefully, they did it on purpose, contaminated her. Well, by the way, this is based on the true story. It's not it's not the story of Karen Silkwood, but the true story. Karen Silkwood was an actual person. Mm. So it's based on a real person. She was purposefully contaminated, psychologically tortured, and possibly murdered to prevent her from exposing the blatant worker safety violations at the plant in 1983's Silkwood. So, DJ... Uh, she was killed in a car well she died in a car accident there are many who think that this car accident was not an accident at all that she was forced off the road and in our movie tonight there is someone who has great evidence against the power plant who is forced off the road and critically injured and prevented from testifying in an important uh, public, well, trial or something. Uh, so uh, the story of Silkwood was not lost on the writers of this movie. Mm. And um, from the uh, broadcasting and journalism angle, and because you reminded me of Robert Redford, I'm also going to recommend a film from 96 called Up Close and Personal, which stars Michelle Pfeiffer and Starker oh. Channing. And it's an ambitious young woman determined to build a career in television journalism, gets good advice from her first boss, and then they fall in love. Oh. By the way, DJ, <clears throat> one of the things I loved about the China Syndrome, mm -hmm. there was no fucking romance <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> so thank you to that. Because the cameraman and Jane Fonda did not fall in love, and Jack Lemmon did not fall in love with Jane Fonda. Oh. And boy, was that nice. Although I didn't see uh, Mrs. or any children in that plant manager's apartment. No. Also, <laughs> oh, I got to mention this because this is one of the most beautiful touches, subtle touches, in developing Jane Fonda's character in... The China Syndrome. She comes home one night, not to a cat, not to a dog, because they actually mean you've got to spend time <laughs> and energy taking care of them. She comes home to a pet tortoise <laughs> that she literally just rolls in and picks up off the floor, carries it to her bed, and just sort of has it under her arm for a spell where she's relaxing, which tells us that this woman has no time to create <laughs> relationships, even with pets. And what a what a wonderful <laughs> bit of writing and telling us what she's all about by just simply including this tortoise. Oh, and you know, the funny thing is, is that tortoises are so long lived that tortoise is probably still alive today. Seriously. She just pulls out a head of lettuce and says, have at it, fella. Ah! <laughs> all right. I'd like DJ, to, I'd like to oh. know if maybe that was uh, Jane Fonda's own personal pet at the time. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who invented that, the writer or Jane Fonda or whoever, but hats off to them mm -hmm. for that little bit. Uh, DJ, I think uh, your selection, Silkwood, is an excellent one. And I want you to watch it, too, because yeah. I haven't seen it. Oh, you haven't? Oh, no. Okay. It's an excellent movie. It's very, oh, it's just, it, it's just an excellent movie. Uh... I'm going to recommend a 1976 movie called All the President's Men because it was also about reporters trying to bring to light a story that would affect all of America. And that, of course, was the Watergate scandal 
that brought down the presidency of Richard Nixon. It was directed by Alan J. Palooka, a screenplay by William Goldman. It's based on the 1974 nonfiction book by the same name by the actual reporters, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, who were portrayed uh, by Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman as Woodward and Bernstein, respectively. And much like the China Syndrome, it's reporters trying to overcome obstacles to bring the truth to uh, the world. So that's my recommendation. Also, if you are interested, I hope you are, in learning more about the Three Mile Island accident itself, in 79 there is a great docuseries on netflix available right now called meltdown three mile island and insiders in this docuseries recount the events and controversies and lingering effects of the accident at the three mile island nuclear power plant in Pennsylvania and if you want to know what it was really all about and how it affects people to this day I recommend Meltdown Three Mile Island 2022 on Netflix Alrighty, so we are out here at the lobby because it's almost time for Gertie to catch her bus Oh, I hope it's not a nuclear powered bus. By the way, I think there was an NBC television series about that. Never mind. I don't (laughs) care. I think it was called The Big Bus. Or maybe I'm thinking of that stupid NBC series with the train. I don't know what I'm thinking. Never mind. I'm, I'm tired. I, and you need to take your medication, ma'am. I need to take my medication. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Toppy. Could you grab that bag of coins? Because, you know, that's how we figure out what's coming up next. All right. Uh, it was left behind by a, a magic guy, let me tell you. And the coins are weird. All right. Here you go. Oh, this one tingles. <laughs> uh, put it in the gumball machine, would you? Okay. Pick that up off the floor before Gertie trips. We don't need another incident. Oh, oh, it's a capsule. And inside, why, it's our our next movie presentation, DJ. Oh. Okay, folks. I just want to tell you, our next movie, if you dare watch it, it's going to F you the hell up. I'm just warning you right now. That's how bizarre this movie is. It's called... The Prestige. It was released in 2006. It's about a tragic accident uh, after which two stage magicians in 1890s London engage in a battle to create the ultimate illusion while sacrificing everything they have to outwit each other. And when you come to the end of this movie, it's going to freaking blow your mind. It was directed by Christopher Nolan. It stars Christian Bale, our beloved Hugh Jackman, Scarlett Johansson, Michael Caine, and, well, just to top everything off, folks, David Bowie. Ah, You are not going to want to miss The Prestige catch it before we talk about it it will f you up all righty so it should be noted folks that uh, we normally do this on the first and third friday of the month and so of course the next time we get together is going to be on friday may 5th so we'll see if april showers turn into may flowers and, uh, you know, that same place, either at matinemanusha.com, you can click on the uh, YouTube logo that takes you to our, our channel. Because, you know, we've been doing this for five years, and you can catch a fair amount of our old shows there. And if you would like to drop in while we do this at 9 p.m. on those Friday nights, you can come into our chat room. It's called Discord. That's what the kids who play the video games are into these days. Yeah. It looks like I a little little game controller or a little blue and white mask. 
Yeah, it's weird. Anyways, it works. And then then you can just plain watch us on YouTube while it's happening. Mm. The main thing is it's live. And uh, DJ, we're always lucky to have a few people to join us live and participate in the chat room. Tonight we had your hubby, Billy Starsage. We had Janet from Another Planet. And we had the ever faithful friend of ours who comes by every single time, Tommy Hash Browns. Thank you guys. It's always nice to have you here when we do this live uh, because it just makes us feel like we're talking to somebody. So thank you. Oh, so Toppy, before we saddle, sidle up to that uh, warm, glowing, uh, you know, vial of uh, radioactive material you smuggled oh, out yeah. there. <laughs> could uh, I got you... it right in my pocket right now. Mm, it feels so good. <laughs> oh, secret ingredient. Um, could you uh, say goodnight the way they did in the old days of radio? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, good night, Gracie. Oh, wait a minute. I gotta tweak this. Hang on. Uh-oh. Let's see. All right, I'm going to do this another way. So, oh. here we go. Good night, folks. Thank you for listening to Matinee Minutia. Our show streams live on the first and third Friday of the month. Go to univospods.net. Click the tower for audio. Enter Discord for chat. You can find our show anywhere you listen to podcasts. Visit our webpage at matineeminutia.com. Tweet us on Twitter at Matinee Minutia. Find our group on Facebook. Have an idea for a show? Or why not let us know how we're doing? Email us at matineeminutia at gmail.com. I have a voice. I have a voice. You have a voice. You have a voice. We have a voice. We have a voice. Unique voices in podcasting. Univaz 